All right. Okay, I was late today. I don't, I try not to be late. In fact, I almost went back home and called in sick. And I thought somebody would catch me, so I thought I better not do that. But I grew up in the southeast, and I've never seen rain like we had from Greenville all the way in nearly to here this morning. Traffic was stopped. Oh, this one not working? Oh, so I got to have this one. Oh, I'm sorry. How's that? Okay, that's better. Anyhow, traffic was stopped. Fire trucks going in all directions and the most gorgeous lightning you've ever seen, just jagged from the sky. But anyhow, I got here as quick as I could, so I apologize for being late. Now, now this is number 11 of these things, and uh, I had to be here for number 11. There's something magic, 7-Eleven, anybody play crap, you know, that sort of thing. But I'm here not to shoot the breeze, but to introduce a really super keynote. He's uh, Dr. Keith Thurgood. And guess what? I got a list of things here. I was told that I had to present this even though you have the information in your stuff. So briefly, clinical professor of healthcare here. He is a adjunct professor of marketing here and entrepreneurship. Sorry, I won't get at everything here. Faculty member and advisor at Thayer Leader Development at West Point. I'm gonna to come to that in just a minute. This is going to surprise you, maybe. President of Healthcare Performance Improvement Company, past president and CEO of Overseas Military Sales Corporation, CEO of Air Force Exchange, held executive positions with Frito Lay and PepsiCo. Are you getting impressed? Has held positions with many nonprofits. And I emphasize that because if you look at his resume, he did a lot of time with nonprofits. And that's not all. Any U.S. Army veterans here? Huh? Only me? Oh, okay. He's also a retired Major General from the U.S. Army. Now, look at all the stuff he did. He spent 28 years in the Army. He did not go to West Point. He did not go to A&M. He did not go to the Citadel. So how did he become a general? He had to be exceptional because that's where the generals come from. He went to Brigham Young, undergraduate. He uh, did graduate work here, there, and yonder. Ended, I don't know, two or three degrees. I won't go into that. But do you know how many generals in the US Army? Hmm? Brigadier generals, there's 176. This is two year information. This guy's a major general. One of 99. There are 53 lieutenant generals and 12 generals. I don't think we do five stars anymore. So it's kind of remarkable that a general from the US Army has such a business background, has the military background, and has come down to us mortals and gonna make a talk here of keynote. <laughs> so Dr. Thurgood, can I say anything else? No, that ain't enough. All right. Great. I want to welcome you here as an old enlisted guy. Thank you. It, it's a pleasure. So, yeah. Well, thanks, Jim. Where'd you go? Thank you, Jim, for that introduction. And you may not know, Jim also spent some time in the Army way before I was born. I'm just saying. Pay the way. <laughs> That's right. So thanks for your service. And for those that raised your hand, thank you for your service as well. It's a pleasure for me to be here today and spend just a few minutes with you talking about my subject, was, which is what I call defeating the status quo and why leaders matter. And what I've learned in all the jobs that I've had, whether it's leading a Fortune 200 company or a smaller company or leading large organizations in the Army, at the end of the day, there's two things that every organization has to get right. The first one is leaders matter. They matter a lot. And they matter at every single level of the organization. Whether you're the accounts payable clerk or the receptionist, or you're the senior vice president of sales, leaders make a difference. 
The second thing that I've learned that's applicable to all organizations is you have to get the strategy right. You have to think clearly about it. You have to think about that strategy as it's tied to the vision and the desired end state. If you don't get those two things right, it's really, really difficult to drive organizational change. It's really difficult to, ex uh, to, to defeat the status quo. So let me start with just a couple of pictures that you might appreciate. First off, the Army. So if you have children that want to go in the Army, come and see me. I might have to direct them to the Navy. <laughs> okay? So you get to choose Army, Navy, right? So this is what it's like to be in the combat zone in an immature theater in Iraq. This is what it's like to be in a, an immature combat zone if you're in the Navy in the Persian Gulf. You got to love pilots. Now, my son is a pilot. He's actually in Iraq right now. He flies helicopters, the big, we call them Chinooks, the ones with the two rotor blades on them. So there's, so Army, Navy, every service has a role to play. I'm biased towards the Army, obviously. I want to show you two more pictures here. This is the supply chain in Afghanistan. Now, how many have anything to do with the supply chain in your positions? How many of you interface with supply chain guys and gals? Almost everybody, probably, right? So I know you think your supply chain is hard. <laughs> and you're always trying to create visibility and inventory visibility and cash visibility inside the system. This is a picture of how we got supplies into Afghanistan. So imagine this. Stuff comes into the port of Karachi in Pakistan, and I'll show you a picture of that in just a minute. We load it on trucks. We send it north up to the Khyber Pass, and we go west into Afghanistan. And we go west on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. On Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, we're coming back the other way. And Sunday's a flex day. Because you know the supply chain is very important in any organization, including the military. So your supply chain isn't as bad as you think it is. <laughs> How would you like to be dealing with this all day long? Imagine trying to move cargo in a very sophisticated supply chain supporting hundreds of thousands of people and you're trying to get a simple container off of a boat into the port so it can be put on a chassis and moved forward into a staging area. Now, there's also one other thing. I don't know if this has a, I don't know, I'm, I'm pointing to this guy right here. <laughs> if you're like the safety guy, <laughs> you're, like, you're not happy with this entire situation. You're not happy with this situation as all. So, now having said that is kind of a little bit of funniness and context, I've also got some slinkies here. So I'm going to toss a slinky to that gentleman right there and to this group right here and to, and to that group back there. And we'll do one more to this group right here that's close. It's, it's, that, see, you know how it was when you got, went to school. Nobody sits close to the professor. Nobody. Okay? So... I've got this slinky here because I want each of these groups to take 30 seconds and talk about what do you think that slinky has to do with organizations? Your time is ticking. <laughs> you get 30 seconds. <laughs> Okay, let's start with this group. What does this have to do with organizations? 
Is that on? It doesn't sound like it's on. There we go. I was recently part of an organization where our motto was Semper Gundy. <laughs> That's, <laughs> you should be the old Marine motto. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, always flexible. So that this implies the same thing. Okay, so flexibility in an organization. Is that important? Absolutely. Okay. Is it also dangerous? Certainly. Okay, let's go to this group. Okay, come on, come on with the mic. Okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, so the team immediately shaped it in unison, flexible, expandable, always moving, changeable, but always connected end to end. Like that. Good. Connected end to end. Very good insight. Okay, what about this group over here? We talk. Hello, are we on? No. Ah, on. <laughs> there you go. We talked about connectivity, flexibility, working as one, and also having fun. Oh, that's good. I like that. Working as one, having fun. Okay, how about this group? They always say the same thing. So it's flexibility, connected, uh, expandable, uh, stress busters. Stress what? Stress busters. Oh, stress, stress busters. busters. Okay. And also, uh, I think getting back to the core, getting back to the original Okay, let's talk about that for just a minute because it's germane to what I want to talk about when you talk about defeating the status quo. So, can you help me here for just a minute? Can you, can you just grab that and go over there, but just walk away with it for a minute? Oops. <laughs> okay, I did let it go. Okay, here we go. That's good right there. Now, organizations have what I call organizational elasticity. And part of the job of a leader that's driving sustainable change is to take the slinky, to take the organization and stretch it out as far as you can without what? Without breaking it. So how many have been involved with change plans that you feel like, <laughs> here's another change. <laughs> it's the change of the day. Don't worry about it. We're not really going to execute it. Just nod your head in the meetings. In a month, it'll all go away. Okay? Because here's what leaders have to do, at least the most effective ones that I know. They take the organizational slinky, so to speak. They stretch it out as far as they can by having good performance measures, by asking hard questions. And they keep just enough tension on the organization so it doesn't break. Now, you brought up a very good point. What happens if the leader stops talking about change and the things that are important at an organization? Whoops, sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. I thought I was going to go back to change. Okay. The slinky, the organization does what? It snaps right back to where it was. It's like the Greek story of Sisyphus who was pushing the stone up the hill. And just as he got it up to the top of the hill, and it was about to go down the other side, it rolls down on him again. And so his eternal punishment was forever to push this hill, this rock up the hill, but never to get it over the end. The same thing happens in organizations. If leaders aren't constantly doing the right kinds of things, the organization because of the elasticity and those that protect the status quo inside of the organization, it will snap right back to where it was. And you can have years of work collapse on you in an instant without constant pressure and tension inside the organization. So leaders have to think differently. They have to act differently in this new disruptive world that we live in. The status quo simply will not do any longer. And that is a hard change for most people. Why? Because most people love the status quo. And they love it because I'm comfortable in my functional silo. I don't have to put any intellectual or emotional energy behind anything. Nobody's bothering me. But in the world that we live in now, in a connected, globalized world, that kind of thinking will not suffice. 
It will be the kind of thinking that will, that will drive an organization down the tubes, so, so to speak. So if you want to win in this connected, globalized economy, you have to be a, kind, a different kind of a leader. You've got to figure out how to defeat the status quo. And I wouldn't be the one to say, well, here's the magic checklist that you have. Go read this book or this model. That's not how it works in the real world. Why? Because people are people. Every organization has its own culture. Things uh, are different. But when there is belief in what you're doing as a leader, there will be trust in what you say. So let me say that again. When there's belief in what you do as a leader, the way you model your behaviors, there will be trust in what you say. That's the only way it works when you're trying to defeat the status quo. You're trying to, to provide disruptive leadership in a, in a very connected economy. So there's three things I want you to remember from today. One, we live in a VUCA world. And I'll tell you what VUCA is if you don't know. Number two, culture drives performance. Period. End of statement. And that culture, that performance, then drives the results that you're looking for. So culture is very, very important. And the challenge is that most leaders spend more time talking about their products and services than they do about the culture of the organization. And therefore, it's difficult to sustain great performance over a long period of time. And finally, leaders matter. They matter a lot. They matter at every single level of the organization. And therefore, think critically about the kind of people that you're hiring and as leaders, we need to look in the mirror every day and make sure that we're doing the things that we believe are right that will drive the organization forward. So, in short, this connected, globalized economy that we live in requires new thinking. It requires an adaptable style of leadership. It requires us to do things <laughs> fundamentally different. <laughs> Okay, okay, there we go. So, let's talk about point number one. We live in a VUCA world. How many have heard of the word VUCA? Can you come up here and help me explain this? I'm just kidding you. <laughs> I'm just kidding you. So, we live in a VUCA world. So, what does VUCA mean? Well, VUCA is a word, that, uh, an acronym that came into being in 1994 that the Army developed. Now, I know you might find this strange that the Army actually has acronyms. <laughs> Some people say, look, my organization has a lot of acronyms. Every organization has a lot of acronyms. You can't escape it. You've got to beat the, beat the status quo down. So in 1994, the Army came up with this acronym because they needed something. They, need a men they needed a mental construct to talk about what the world would look like after the fall of the Soviet Union. So they came up with this word, VUCA. It's probably the only thing you're going to remember today. VUCA. <laughs> what the? <laughs> it really became powerful after the terrorist attacks on 9-11. People started to think about it. So what does VUCA mean? I'm going to talk about each of these just briefly in context. VUCA stands for a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environment. That's the VUCA world. Do we live in a VUCA world? If we ever lived in a VUCA world, it's today. If you, if, and you think about your own organizations, do you live in a VUCA organization? It's volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, and it's, a lot of times it's ambiguous. So, the funny thing about VUCA is, though, it's not something to be solved. It simply is. It's the way the world works today. And when you attempt to try to break VUCA down into its components so they could theoretically be managed better, what you end up with is even more complexity. 
Because VUCA is what it is. It's the global environment. It's the environment that you work in in your own organization. It's a network of networks. It's a network phenomenon. And so as the world gets more vulcanized, <laughs> I don't know if that's a word, probably not, vulcanized, and it's getting that way every single day, it makes it very difficult to think about running a business the way you used to run the business. Why? Because forecasting is now more difficult. Understanding and mitigating risk is more difficult, not only to predict, to forecast, but to put plans against. Crises in a globalized economy are, have a huge ripple effect. It is, as they say, when the butterfly flaps his wing in one continent, we have a hurricane in another. That's why when Thailand has a supply chain problem, where we get 40% of our computer chips, there's a massive global issue. When there's a fire in a manufacturing plant in Mexico, Europe fills it. And all of these things are connected in broad, significant ways, and they're hard to predict. You couple that with shifting demographics, with aging population, this becomes very complicated. And then you layer in some technology and some innovation. This is why we need a new kind of leader. We can't continue to think the old way. Why? Because the old way won't get us to where we need to go in the future. So my challenge to you is think about this new VUCA word. Let me, let me talk about each of these just, just briefly so you get a flavor for them. So what does volatile mean? You may have your own definition. But it to me, it reflects the speed and the turbulence of change. That's what we know. We know that the status quo will never be what it is. Things will continually change. In fact, the Boston Consulting Group, BCG, they did a study, and they looked at the last 50 years of data, and they found that the, last, the most turbulent quarters in the last half a century, from a business perspective, have happened since 2002. So it's getting more complex. It's getting harder and harder to navigate in. What about uncertainty? Well, what do we know about uncertainty? We know one thing for sure. The familiar things won't work anymore. It makes decision making more complicated because you don't have all of the information that you used to have and you can't even rely on the information that you do have because it changes so much. So let me tell you a war story. It's Iraq, late 2006. Now, I don't know if you remember in 2006 and 7, but those, that was the really ugly year in Iraq. It's when our IEDs peaked. We had lots of wounded and lots of KIAs in that time frame. KIA stands for killed in, uh, killed in action. Uh, I forgot where I was going with the story. <laughs> it was, oh, uh, yeah, it was a difficult time. That's what I, that was, that's what I was talking about. <laughs> Look, I've got five kids and 13 grandkids, so you gotta cut me a little slack here every once in a while. It's a very difficult time in Iraq. Lots of dangerous things are happening. It was also the same time that then President Bush was saying, we have to put more soldiers on the ground in Iraq. He called them the surge brigades, and there were five of them. A brigade is about seven to 8,000 people, somewhere in that neighborhood. And they wanted to put those, brig uh, those brigades on the ground to stabilize what was happening in Iraq and in uh, and Baghdad specifically. So my job at the time, I was running a supply chain for Iraq and Afghanistan and supporting Kuwait and the Horn of Africa. And every day we would send supplies from a staging area in Kuwait. And we would send these trucks north to a resupply location that would then get redistributed out to units. We sent everything from chapstick and you know, Pepsi and Frito-Lay to water, including tanks. On one particular day, we sent a convoy out that had a truck that looked like this and a tank on it. Now there's two drivers in every single truck. And this truck has uh, 
It's called a heavy equipment transport, and it can transport about 70 tons of tank. So it's a big, heavy load. We would, in preparation for the actual convoy move, we would issue an order. That order would then be executed down through the specific units. When the unit that was going to execute the order got the order, they would then start their planning. And they would plan three to six days ahead of time. They would rehearse the route. They would do route recons. They would understand uh, who was going to be in the convoy, the kinds of supplies in the convoy. They would do map recons. It was a very sophisticated process in terms of rehearsal that they would go through. They would go through scenarios A, B, and C. This convoy takes off on its way up to Baghdad. These all, they're almost always moving at night on its way to Baghdad. The convoy is ambushed. And during the ambush, which are short and violent, the convoy got separated of about 40 trucks. 20 trucks continued on. 20 trucks kind of got caught in the crossfire a little bit. While all of this is happening, some of the drivers that made it through the ambush were getting out of their trucks and they were going to take the tanks off the trailers to go help those that were still stuck inside the ambush. So you can imagine how intense that gets and the decisions that have to be made on the fly. While they're doing all that, the ambush is taking place over here. Things settle down about 30 minutes later, although it seems like forever. And then the soldiers start to do what we expect our soldiers to do. They start to do a head count. Everybody okay? Who's missing? Do we have all of our equipment? What about our weapons? Anybody have any ammunition left? And in the course of that battle damage assessment, this unit discovered that there was a soldier missing. And the reason they discovered that the soldier was missing is because they went to the cab of the truck, and in the truck was nothing but the body armor, a helmet, and some other protective equipment. And the, the shirt, the blouse that this, it was a female soldier was wearing was all in the cab of the truck. So you're in, an, you're in a fight, you go to the cab of the truck, you can't find the female soldier, what's your first reaction? POW, she's been kidnapped. So I get this frantic phone call back at the headquarters, sir, so-and-so here, everybody's okay with the exception of we can't find specialist whatever her name was. And I said, well, what, what, do, you, what do you mean you can't find her? What does that mean? She's not in the truck, sir. All we have is her body armor and her blouse. Well, how do you know it's her? Well, because we read the name tag. Okay, that, okay, you got it. So in the fog of battle, in this VUCA world, you're always trying to search for ground zero truth. So I've got all this stuff running through my head now. Oh my gosh, we're going to have a POW. It's going to be a big deal. What are we going to do about it? So I said, I wanted clarity. <laughs> okay. I said, are we sure that we can't find this soldier? Stand by. Ten minutes later, which seems like an eternity, <laughs> okay, they come back on the radio. Sir, we cannot find this soldier. I said, are you sure? <laughs> okay. I want clarity. It's an uncertain world. I, this is a big deal. Sir, we can't find her. Okay, I said, I'm going to give you guys five more minutes. <laughs> okay. You call me back in five minutes, and if you don't find this soldier, I have to make a phone call. And i got to call my three-star general and tell him that we're, we have a soldier that's missing. And when I do that, there is going to be all kinds of wheels that go in motion. I, the world's going to come unglued for us, right? So they came back, sir, the soldier's gone. So I don't want to make this phone call, but I have to. Because I still, in the back of my mind, I'm not sure, right? Because when you're in these situations, stuff happens so fast, it, it becomes unclear. So I said, well, okay. So I sat and I thought about it for a few minutes. And I'm walking over to the phone to call my boss and say, we have, a, we have a, a POW issue here. I'm picking up the phone and, and my aide runs in and says, sir, sir, sir. They found her. I'm like, okay, wait a minute. They found her? How do you know? <laughs> okay. And I had 10 questions. I said, 
go ask these questions, right? Because you, you can't come to me and say, we can't find her. And then I'm about to make this phone call and say, we found her. I have to be sure on this, okay? So they went through the series of questions. Time's still ticking. I'm getting nervous. I'm getting nervous. And they said, okay, we found her because in the convoy, what happened was somehow she got separated and she ended up in another vehicle, right? Now, then I had all kinds of questions. Well, how did she get out of her body armor and all that kind of stuff, which was for later, right? And so at the end of the day, we found this soldier in another truck in another location. But I got to tell you, in those few minutes when I was trying to work through this issue, it was a VUCA moment. It was unclear. It was complex. The information was ambiguous. And it was a totally volatile situation. So uh, the decisions that we make as leaders may not be life and death. And it may not call down all of the resources of the United States government on you. But the decisions that you make inside your organization feel like that sometimes. If you're a salesperson, you're in combat every day. And the worst thing that can happen in an organization is for the sales team to be over here and the functional teams to be over here. Because in most organizations, what happens in these kinds of worlds, and this is how VUCA manifests itself, in these, in these organizations, the sales teams will say, I could sell a bunch of stuff if only operations could deliver it. <laughs> and operations is saying, if only the sales guys would stop making these ridiculous commitments to our customers. <laughs> we can't deliver on them. And it happens every day in any organization that has a selling and an operational arm. What about complex? Well, complexity indicates a bunch of different things. For one thing, it indicates the vastness of the interdependencies of what's happening in the world. So here's an example of what that looks like. Whoop. There you go. That's somebody's org chart. I don't, you know. You're trying to get stuff done, okay? But it's so complicated, you can't even wrap your head around it anymore because why? You don't understand the first, second, third order effects of the decision anymore. When a butterfly flaps its wings inside your organization, if you're not thinking clearly, you don't know what's gonna happen to the sales team or the customer at the end of the day or the project that you're working on. So I've developed a simple rule for managing complexity and it's this, simple, equals execution, and execution equals results. So don't try to solve VUCA. It is what it is. It's not solvable. You have to take the environment as it is and figure out how to execute in that in the best way that you can. Ambiguous, if you're, if you're and ambiguity means a bunch of different things. It means for one thing, I totally don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> and you have this in your daily conversations. Things become ambiguous, they become unclear. And you might be absolutely convinced that you're saying and explaining it correctly. But the person receiving the message, miss, uh, a message hears something completely different, which then leads to friction in the organization. Now the good news is, there's an, an anecdote for all this. So remember, we live in this VUCA world. VUCA is volatile, it is uncertain, it is complex, it is ambiguous. The anecdote for volatility is vision. If there's one thing that I've learned, leaders have to be specific and clear about where they're taking the team or the organization and why they're going there. Failure to do that will cause strategies to be unproductive, it will waste resources in the organization. So clarity in the vision is important, which ties to the C that I'll talk about in a minute. And you have to communicate that vision relentlessly. Because if you don't, here's what will happen in your organization, I think. Uh, okay, here we go. Let's see if... Ha, ha, ha. 
<laughs> Whoops. <laughs> okay. If you're not clear on what you want your team and your organization to focus on, your team will be doing all kinds of activity. And you talk to them and they'll tell you, I've got work that I could be here 24-7, 365. I am never going to accomplish all the work that you've asked me to go do. But when you start to ask them questions like, why are you scraping that car off? <laughs> you're scraping the wrong car off. The activity you're doing is not tied to anything. Oh, but you know what? I've got my head down. I'm panning for gold. My boss told me I had to move my slinky from A to B. Why do you do that? Look, how long have you been here? You, mu you must be new in the organization. My boss said, move this from A to B, and that's what I get paid to do. But why? Look, obviously you're a new guy. We... Just do what you're supposed to do. So the point is, if you don't provide clarity, people will scrape the wrong car off and you ask them how busy they are, they will tell you, I'm super busy. And what I've found in project management, in organizations at large, you can probably take 10 to 20% of somebody's work day away if you allow them to focus on the very specific thing that will drive the strategy that will drive the end state, the vision. Now here's what I want you to do. How many of you do reports at work? There's gotta be more people doing reports, come on. Okay, that's more like it. Okay, now here's what I want you to do to test this out. When you get back to your workstation, I want you to do the report like you normally do, only don't send it out. Don't send it out. And wait for the calls and see how many people will call you and say, hey, Keith, I didn't get your weekly report this week. And you're like, oh, yeah, sorry, I finished it. I just didn't hit send. Here it goes. What you're going to find is that 95% of the people that you're doing the work for never look at the report. They don't care. Why? Because they're scraping the wrong car. Therefore, your KPIs, your performance management, defeating the status quo, providing disruptive leadership in a connected economy, be clear about what you want to accomplish and get the right measures in place. Do I only have 15 minutes left? Oh, I've got 30 minutes left. With the Q&A. Oh, my gosh. Okay. We're never going to get through all this. That's okay. I may have to skip through a few stories here and then we'll ask questions. Okay, understanding, we talked about that. The best leaders that I know are curious leaders. They ask questions, and they've learned to ask the right kinds of questions that solicit an action that will drive them towards their end state. In order to understand, you have to look, you have to learn, you have to listen. You can't always be the smartest person in the room. Clarity, we simplify everything as much as we can. We connect the clarity and our messaging to the vision so that we can execute that in ways that make sense. And finally, as we talked about the slinky earlier, you have to be agile. You absolutely have to be agile. If you're not agile, you'll never survive. You will never be adaptive. And most consulting firms, most of the literature that you read today is, says that the most successful firms in the future, even those today, companies like Amazon, are those that have developed an adaptive mindset. That's what they think about. Because what worked yesterday won't work tomorrow, and ask anybody in the retail business that still thinks brick-and-mortar stores are the way to go. So that gets me to this idea of culture. And I, I was gonna, I'm not going to play this, but I'm going to tell you this story because I'm going to get to point number two. It's the, it's the video clip of President Kennedy saying in 1962, before the end of the decade, we're going to put a man on the moon. Everybody seen that clip? Okay? Before he made that speech, he had consulted with his scientists, his advisors, and you know what they told him? It's impossible. We can't do it. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're going to the moon. Okay? That's the power of vision. So he does that. So I want to tell you this story now about STS 107, because I want to tie the. 
performance and culture to this particular event. So this is a guy named Sean O'Keefe. He said, some events in our lives change the way that we think. They help us judge, judge the successes of yesterday. They gauge the relative importance of a decision today and ultimately decide the course we set for tomorrow. So here's the story. It's January 2003. STS-107, NASA's 113th mission is taking off, the Columbia. All the appropriate work had been done. But during that mission, on its way home, there was something very bad that happened. And it happened as it flew over the skies of Texas. I remember this day very clearly. The wreckage from the re-entry, scattered material over 2,000 square miles. Immediately after this happened, NASA created a board to investigate the investigation. They called it very cleverly the Columbia Accident Investigation Board. Um, and they went to work immediately on figuring out what had happened. And what they found was that 81.7 seconds into the flight, a piece of foam, much like this one, that weighed 1.7 pounds, clicked off the thermal protective system. You can see that there, the one that's circled. And it came off and it hit the left leading edge wing. And the damage caused to that caused, over time, the, 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 uh, when it re-entered re the atmosphere, the heat penetrated the damaged portion and started to melt the frame of the wing, which then caused the whole thing to lose its aerodynamic capacity, which then led to the explosion and disintegration of the company, the, the Columbia. And in that tragic accident, we lost seven of our astronauts. Now here's the part that drives you nuts. The engineer said, we need to inspect the damage. We need to come up with some solutions to the damage. But the leader said what? We've known about foam hitting our wings for, 50, for 20 years. So think about that. We've known about foam hitting the wings for 20 years. We've never had an accident yet. We live in a VUCA world, folks. So they determined that the cause of the problem was this piece of foam, 1.7 pounds. At least that's what they said the physical damage was. But there's more to the story. You know what the real cause of the Columbia accident was? The real issue was an issue of leadership and culture. The accident, the report said, was a product of long-term organizational problems dating back decades. And more specifically, they concluded the accident was probably not an anomalous, meaning a single event, random event, but rather likely rooted in NASA's history and the human space flight program's culture. Culture drives outcomes. And so in a VUCA world, you cannot afford to underestimate the power of culture. Culture drives performance, and that is the coin of the realm for leaders. So why should we care about culture? What does this arrow tell you? Does this look like your organization? <laughs> so you got the big yellow arrow. Who's that? That's your CEO. That's your senior leadership who went to a secret offsite and came back with a vision. <laughs> and they said, here's the direction we're going. Everybody nods. Oh, I love it. I'm nodding my head. Right? But what's happening deep inside the organization, inside the culture? You got all these little arrows here. You got the black, the, uh, some people, the black arrows are like, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, you know, I don't know if I can say it publicly, but I'm with you. I don't want to make my teammates mad. And then you got a group 
<laughs> that's like, what are you guys talking about? There's no way we can do any of this. And they're fundamentally disengaged in the culture of the organization. Culture makes a difference. And you can't come from Mount Sinai with the tablets and the vision and throw it on the organization. That's not sustainable. You have to engage people. The team has to be engaged in a different way. So why is that important? Because 87% of employees worldwide are not engaged in their company. 70% in the US. Companies that are highly engaged or do have a highly engaged work for, uh, workforce outperform those that don't by 147%. And sadly, most companies are only maximizing 5% of their workforce. Does that make any sense? And oh, by the way, for every quarter imp improvement in employee engagement scores made, majored, uh, measured on a Likert 1 to 10 score scale, for every quarter of a point that you improve that, it's worth 2.5% to the bottom line. Why? Because people are engaged. They're productive. They want to make a difference. Most people don't show up to work saying, I'm going to you know, do everything I can to make this a bad company. People want to do the right thing, but we haven't created the culture that allows them to do that. And oh, by the way, we know these facts. 71% of ours believe, they believe in engagement. They talk about it. I, I want to do it, okay? They even understand that recognition in some form or fashion is important. And yet they also look at all of that data and say, you know, 5 to 25% of our company is engaged in our business. <laughs> Can you imagine the power of an organization that had 90% of its people highly engaged and making a difference every single day? I mean, talk about productivity and service to the clients and margin improvements. That is a big difference. It would be fundamentally. So you know what kind of organizations are very explicit about their culture? The successful ones. You may know that author, <laughs> okay? Therefore, do not underestimate point number two. Culture drives performance. It's not something that's flowery. It's very, very important to get that right. So I'm going to skip a couple. Well, I'm going to play this short video for you, okay? Let's see if I can get it. So listen, and I'm going to pause this every once in a while. We're going to run out of time, but I'll, I'll do what I can here. Okay, well, let's, let's just pause it there for a minute. So what's the signal that the, the supervisor's sending to Lucy? Your job is to move this slinky from A to B. Your job is to wrap the chocolate, okay? And by the way, in this company, no good deed goes unpunished, okay? So I won't play the rest of it because it's, it's a great lesson on culture. So they're in there and they're, they're saying, well, this isn't too bad. And they go like that. And then the supervisor comes in and sees how good they're doing. And she says, speed the machine up, right? You guys can be more productive. And they're like, oh, okay. And pretty soon the, they're, the chocolates are coming so fast they can't do it. And they're throwing them in the garbage. They're putting them in their hat. They're trying to eat them. And then the supervisor walks in because they don't want to disappoint the supervisor. So they're trying to scoop all the chocolates off. The <laughs> it's a bad culture. So that story, that thing happens every day in our organizations. We're eating chocolates. We're trying to please people without clearly understanding where we're trying to go. So I'm going to have to skip over some of that. So let me, let me, let me, let me talk about this, and I'm going to get to a couple other stories. So what is culture? Culture, it, culture is about the things that the organization values deeply. And they're different for every organization. And you can rest assured if you're not shaping your culture in your organization, it is being shaped. You're just not influencing it. 
Now, these journeys in changing culture and defeating the status quo take a while. It's a journey, just like our own personal leadership journey. And then the third bullet point here, the whole point of the culture is to drive the success of the enterprise. So you shouldn't walk away here, in my estimation, thinking that culture's kind of the, how we feel good about ourselves. Culture is the essence of the organization, and that culture, I'll skip that, is grounded on values. These values probably sound familiar to you. Integrity, communication, respect, excellence. Guess what? Those four values were chiseled in granite in the lobby of Enron. We know what happened to Enron. So my point is this. It's one thing to talk about values. It's one thing to talk about culture. It's another thing to live them. Because your life is your message. Going back to what we talked about earlier, you have to model the behaviors you want in your organization. So culture matters. Culture begins with your belief system and it finds expression in behaviors. And the natural consequence of behaviors is what? The results that you get, either in your personal life, in your team, or your organization. It's the fruit. Most companies focus on the KPI, and they forget about the stuff that's driving the performance, which is the culture. So point number two, culture matters. So point number three, I was going to tell you the story of Joshua. In fact, I'm, I am going to tell you the story of Joshua. I may have to cut the questions down by maybe 10 minutes, five minutes. We'll figure it out. It's July the 2nd, 1863. It's the Civil War. The battle is in the second day at Gettysburg. There's a hill in Gettysburg called Little Round Top. Now, you don't have to be a general to know the answer to this question. Do you want the low ground or the high ground in a battle? You want the high ground, okay? They see Little Round Top, and... The Confederates and, uh, thank you, the Confederates <laughs> and the Union see that Little Round Top is up there and there's nobody on the hill. So they both recognize that about the same time. The first people to the hill, though, were the Union soldiers. And they recognized that if they could hold Little Round Top, they could sway the battle and maybe the outcome of Gettysburg at large, because the first day of the battle, you could make a very strong argument that it was really won by the Confederates. And as the second day started, it was really being won by the Confederates. They race to the top of Little Round Top. They start to spread the line out on what they call Cemetery Ridge. Or, I'm sorry, Cemetery Ridge. One of the guys that got to the top of the mountain with orders was a guy named Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. He was the commander of the 20th Maine. And remember back in those days, the state militias all had their own numbers and they were from a specific state. So he's in charge of the 20th, he's in charge of the 20th Maine. He's not even a professional soldier. He's a professor at UTD. I'm sorry. He's a, he, he's a professor at Bodine College in Pennsylvania. <laughs> okay. But he feels like he's got to contribute, right? So he contributes to the cause. He's assigned to be the commander of this unit. His, his mission on top of Little Round Top is he's the very last unit on top of Little Round Top. He's the far left. There's nobody behind him. There's nobody to the left. If the Confederate Army can outflank him, they can collapse the Union line, take control of Little Round Top, and the battle becomes, gets a different outcome. He gets his soldiers, and he spreads them out across this line, super thin. He's supposed to have about 500 in his unit. He's down to 250. He spreads them out the best he can. The Confederates are, start to attack from a place called Devil's Den. And they start to attack up this rocky terrain, and he's got his soldiers spread out, and they repel the attack. And you know who was attacking them, by the way? General Hood from Texas. <laughs> and, and uh, some folks from Alabama. And they attack up this hill, they're repelled. They attack up the hill again, they're repelled. They attack up again they're, the hill and they're repelled. The Union runs out of ammunition. There's nothing left. 
They're 50% strength. Now they're ammunition. The Confederates are coming again. So what does Joshua Chamberlain do in that very complicated VUCA environment? He pulls out his sword. And he says, fix bayonets. All of his soldiers put their bayonets on. And then he says, follow me. And they charge down the hill and repel the attack. And the day is won because of that action in Gettysburg. The next day wasn't his lucky day, though. They wanted to give his unit a rest. So they took him down and put him in the middle of the Union line, which were picket charged the next day. But the story is this. You can make a difference. This is a leader that was clear about what he wanted to be done. He was given very specific clarity. Follow me. Model the behaviors. So I'm totally out of time. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you this last story and we'll turn it over to questions. In August of 2007, we had a Burger King. I had responsibility for one of the organizations that I had to monitor to, to do a bunch of stuff, one of which was casual dining. So the military has casual dining facilities all across the globe, including in the combat zones. So believe it or not, we had a big Burger King in Baghdad and surrounding locations. In fact, the Burger King in Baghdad, for a period of time, was the highest grossing Burger King in the world. <laughs> now, it's like, why, why would a soldier do that? Because we supply them everything they need to survive. Food, which is good food, by the way. It wasn't like, you know, when Jim was in the Army, which was terrible back in 1956. It's like good, okay? And, it, and so th this soldier that you see here was at one of our Burger Kings in Iraq. There was a mortar attack. And the mortars came in and blew up the Burger King. And there were three people that were killed. There were several wounded. This young soldier was standing in line to get his hamburger. He'd already made the order. And he was just kind of waiting there when the mortar attack happened. And he did what we expect all of our soldiers to do. He helped the wounded. He policed up the battlefield. He, he did whatever he could to help. And then after two or three hours after the incident was kind of starting to calm down a little bit, he went back to his unit. He was an infantry guy. And then he was out doing missions and etc. Three days later, he came back to the Burger King after we'd re re rebuilt it. He comes up to the manager and he says, hey, my name is so-and-so. Do you remember me? No, I don't remember who you are. Well, I was here when the Burger King got blown up. The thing is, I never got my burger, <laughs> okay? And, and here's my receipt, okay? So the manager of the Burger King looked at him and said, we have a policy <laughs> that we can't give burgers out just because you have a receipt. You gotta get your burger when it comes off the line. I, I know, but it, there was a, it was attacked. It got blown up. I didn't get my burger. Look, I'm sorry about that, but you can't have a burger. Can you believe that? <laughs> now, you're probably thinking, what? who would do that? Well, if you're the Burger King manager, and, you're, and pressure's on you to perform from a profitability standpoint, and a, guess what? You're not giving away burgers, because the average cost of a meal at a Burger King is $5.85. Every time you do that, that's profit gone. So align the performance metrics correctly. So here's the story, rest of the story. I'm in an airplane, and I read this story in a newspaper. And I was, I, I was like, I'm like, this can't be right. We, there's no way we would do this. In the combat zone, for crying out loud. For somebody that works for me. <laughs> so I, put, I got a big red pen, and I circled it, the article, and I sent it to the chief operating officer with a note that said, please investigate this. And the answer that I want to hear is, we didn't do this. It's the wrong story. <laughs> trying to set the culture. <laughs> so he, he came back a few days later and he said, sir, guess what? We did it. We did it to this soldier. And I said, okay, well, we got to fix this. So I called the CEO at Burger King and I told him this story. <laughs> okay. He was home on leave from Iraq. 
the senior executives from Burger King flew to his house. And I was up there myself. I was out there doing some other stuff. We took him out to dinner. He and he wasn't married. We took he and his mom and dad out to dinner. And the Burger King guys were so great. They gave him this plaque that said, you know, you're the king or something like that. And, and, and they gave him, like, coupons for life. <laughs> so if you see him around at the airport, he's probably got a couple of these coupons around. So we made it right for this young soldier. Then we went back and we looked at the policy. And we said, well, who, who wrote the policy? Well, sir, that, that's one of your policies. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> well, let's change the policy then. So we, we, made, we got it all right at the end of the day. So let, let me just, I got another, I have to skip that story. Just remember this. Disruptive leadership is about defeating the status quo. And the two biggest enemies of change are history and success. Because people are always saying in their own organizations, well, hey, that's, you know, we've, we've done it this way before. It's always been successful. Or, hey, we've tried that before. It doesn't, you know, on and on. So the two biggest enemies of change, of defeating the status quo, of providing disruptive leadership in this connected economy are history and success. Now remember this. Three things I want you to think about. One, be absolutely clear about where you want to go and why you want to go there. That's the only way to get it done in a VUCA world. Number two, Model the behaviors because that sets the tone and the culture for your organization. Your life is your message. And finally, defeat the status quo by stretching the organization to the extent that you can and constantly put pressure on the organization because if you don't, it will snap right back to the slinky that I talked about earlier. And finally, remember this. You will leave a legacy. The question is, what kind of a legacy will you leave? In fact, you're already leaving a legacy. You are already known for something in your organization right now. The question is, is that what you want your legacy to be? If not, think about disruptive leadership. Think about defeating the status quo and making a difference by the life that you lead. Thanks, and I'll answer questions. <laughs> Now, I have this rule. I don't leave unless there's at least two questions that get asked. <laughs> yes, okay, Deb. <laughs> I want to know why the rule has a blouse lunch. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good question. Well, the reason she did that is because it was hot. Well, that's really not an excuse, so she got punished for that. Uh, even though, it, it, not to mention the gray hair that I got from the whole thing, it was just too hot in that truck. And so she said, well, I'm just going to take my stuff off. And that's what happened. So, again, we had a policy about keeping your, gear, keeping your gear on. That's why she took it off. No really good reason she got hot. Now, you can understand that. It's, it's 140 degrees in Iraq, and you're putting all that gear on. It, it just burns you up. That's kind of a semi-question, but we'll count it. Okay, anything else? Yes, sir. Thank you, Keith, for taking my question. Um, I work for a number of blue chips in the United Kingdom and here in the United States. And I've noticed that most of these companies refer to the chief executives, the C-suite, the senior VP, as the leadership team. Yeah. Now, I remember sitting in one large town hall meeting where uh, successive SVPs and C-suite people were brought out. And every time they were introduced as one of our leaders, there would be sniggers in the audience. So I wonder, why do you think the people in the audience were sniggering? I, well, I mean, who knows? I'll give you my opinion. I think it comes back to, if I can get back to this real quick. Uh, uh, shoot. I, I, I think I probably passed it. Oh, well, that's a good chart. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. Here's why I think, right? At the end of the day, people inside that organization had no trust with the leadership. The leadership didn't model the behaviors they expected others to uh, behave from which they should behave. They, there was probably very little collaboration and trust in that organization. 
And so when somebody says, I'm a leader, there's a certain responsibility, a major responsibility that goes with that. It means that I'm going to behave in ways that I want others to behave. I'm going to treat others like they want to be treated. I'm going to uh, be a leader of what I would call character and competence, right? So there's three components of leadership. Again, I, take everything I'm saying with a grain of salt. You've got to go figure it out yourself. Because sometimes I'm asked, give me the best leadership book. Give me the flow chart. <laughs> can, you, can you Gantt chart this out for me? Leadership doesn't work like that. Leadership is personal. And you have to figure out what it is for you. But at the end of the day, the most effective leaders that I know are leaders of character. And they do two things and they get these two things right all of the time. One is they deliver results, whatever those results are, and they're consistent over time. Commensurate with that, though, is leaders get the results in a certain way. I call that their character, right? So it's the combination, if you had to figure a math formula, if you say if effectiveness, I mean, results plus the character of the leader equals effective leadership. That's what leaders do at the end of the day. And I would suspect in your organization, at the end of the day, they didn't trust anybody. And you can fancy yourself and call yourself a leader all you want, but if you're not doing the core things that leaders do, you don't, you're not exhibiting the characteristics, the character, and the competencies, it's, it's impossible to drive organizational change. And some people will say, well, look, look, it's, the, leaders haven't, the, the leaders haven't done anything for me, right? How about this for an idea? You become the leader that others can look to. And when you do that, your circle of influence starts to grow from this to this. Kind of a long-winded answer, but there you go. Okay, that's two. All right, any, oh, one more. Yes, sir. Leadership versus management. I find that managers are really just driving the train on the track. They're not creating new tracks like leaders do. So can you talk about that difference between leaders and manager or leadership and management? Yeah, that's a great question. And people often confuse the difference between a manager and a leader. And I would describe it like this, which is much like you just described. The job of a leader is to think about the growth of the organization, which means you're externally focused. A manager's job is to think about how to run the organization efficient, as efficiently as you can, and that's an internal focus. So a leader says, we're going to attack that mountain. The manager then says, I'm going to figure out how to attack that mountain in the most efficient way that I can. So managers tend to be more focused on things centered around performance, whereas a leader is, taught, is more concerned about the direction of the company. Now, do you need both in an organization? You absolutely do. Can you be a manager and a leader? Yes, you can. One day you might be more of a manager than a leader because you're spending a lot of time talking about the sales forecast. So I think both are needed in the organization, both are important, but there's a distinct role that each plays, and it doesn't matter if you're the CEO of the company or you're the leader of a small team. You can do, these principles apply to us as individuals, they apply to teams, and they apply to organizations at large. Yes, sir. So I'll apologize, it's going to be a long question before I Oh, okay, good, I can get along. So, so I'm going back to your skit about using the slinky, right? Yes. Yeah. So stretching and comes back to your no shape and you're starting with the status quo again. Uh, I'm just trying to try to understand why didn't you use the reason of elastic band where when you're driving the chain, it gets to the maximum strength and when you reach it, you keep it at the maximum strength, it will, you know, it will lose the coefficient of elasticity and that becomes the new norm instead of going back to its original state. It was elastic. I didn't use the rubber band because I'm not as smart as you. <laughs> That's a really good metaphor. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to have to use that next time. Can I steal that? Good. That's, that's a great metaphor. That's perfect. I can add nothing to that. Except thank you. <laughs> okay. I know time's up. It's been my... Did you have a question? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. We'll take this last question. <laughs> the question is, what is my number one personality trait that makes me an effective leader? Well, I would describe it like this. Jim said earlier, not too many people get promoted to general. And when I got promoted to general, my wife said, are you serious? 
<laughs> so, I wouldn't say this is one of my great ones, but leaders have to be humble. I throw that out. I, it, my wife would say, that's not you. <laughs> okay? I think leaders have to be humble and self-aware. So, I, I think one of my characteristics uh, is I love to make sure that we have a very clear vision of what we're trying to accomplish. So I would default back to describing what the vision is of an organization and then trying to communicate that broadly across the organization. And if you think about an organization that has two or 300,000 people in it, that takes time, right? So I think one thing that, that is very helpful for leaders is to, is to be very clear on the vision and then articulate that vision and communicate it clearly and then develop the supporting strategies. That's how I would, that's how I, would, I don't know. What do I know? I'm so right. Thanks. Thank you, General. You know, as an old Army guy, two-year draftee, which makes me a flaky Army guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wouldn't say that, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I can say it, don't be honest. But, uh, transferring the thought as a general yes. with troops to whom you can give orders to civilian management people who are adverse to direct orders. How tough is that transition? Well, I think it depends on your view of leadership. So the best generals that I know in the Army are not generals that give orders all the time. The best generals that I know and leaders at every level of the army, as a matter of fact, are leaders that have learned to collaborate and communicate at a totally different level. So yes, in the army, you can direct people with direct orders, but guess what? That's not how you empower people. That's not how you build trust and credibility over the long term. It works when you're in the ambush. It doesn't work when you're trying to transform the United States Army. Same thing in organizations. You can be a dictator if you want to, but it's not sustainable. So for me, it wasn't that bad. Maybe that's a better answer to your question. <laughs> for me, it wasn't that bad. But for some people coming out of the Army, it's a tough transition. So great. There, there it is. Thank you. Great insights uh, from, from two sides of the coin. Yes. And, and uh, I appreciate it. Here's a little token of our appreciation. Thank you very time, much. Thank you very much. Information, and you can also have free lunch. Free lunch. I like that. <laughs> OK, very good. Okay. Thanks a lot.